the uh, red X shows you where the uh, wreck is. It's it's uh, kind of in the middle of nowhere, uh, uh, along the edge of the Little Bahama Bank, where the deep water meets shallow water. The site itself is in about oh 15 feet of water, and uh, um, virtually no land to be seen anywhere around. So we had to go and, and uh, put everything that we might need on board our research vessel and just uh, prepare to live out there as long as we possibly could, uh, sort of in a, a self-sufficient way. Uh, and uh, that we did for uh, what we thought was going to be one summer turned out to be many. Now, as we worked on the site, the, the only really speck of land that we could see was this. This is called Memory Rock, and Memory Rock is the most godforsaken island, uh, I think, that could be imagined. It's the it's, uh, uh, size of, at best, a, a small house and, and is nothing but sharp, jagged rock. Um, very little to... Uh, uh, offers in the way of shelter or comfort on this thing and we always used to imagine as we were working on the wreck you know as if, if this was the only place they had to go to um, that was worse than being on the, the shipwreck um, beautiful underneath not very appealing uh, on top now as I said before we would uh, go and, and uh, live on our our research vessel uh, for as long as we could anchored out on the site. Uh, we used four different research vessels. This is one uh, called the, the Beta. Was, uh, this was a, a catamaran. Uh, we used a tugboat, uh, converted uh, sport fishermen, uh, a wide variety of, of different vessels that we used. Um, all worked quite well for the most part and uh, provided a home away of home in the middle of the ocean for us uh, f for up to uh, six or eight weeks at a time. People have sort of a cartoon notion of what a, a shipwreck looks like. They envision a beaten up uh, hull sitting on the bottom with a skeleton draped across a wheel and some tattered sails rippling in the currents. Uh, it's nothing like that. What we're talking about uh, the warmer waters of the general Caribbean area um, and there are too many creatures in these waters that are willing to eat the organic remains of a ship and so uh, the hull uh, essentially deteriorates over time and what we wind up with is a flattened pancake of some of the ship's remains um, buried under many feet of sand and sediment so um, what you wind up with after centuries is a scene like this. Uh, this is a shipwreck after roughly 450 years. If you're ever uh, diving or snorkeling and, and you know you come across something like this, uh, you should be excited because that is a shipwreck. Now the first step in uh, documenting the St. John's wreck was to take that area that you just saw and uh, grid it off into five meter increments and then map in everything that could be seen on the surface of that grid as well as uh, to go over it with uh, metal detectors and, and uh, uh, mark in any uh, readings we might get with those to give us a sense of what was underneath. Um, and it, it worked pretty well. We found a, a wide scatter of stone ballast, some uh, ceramic uh, sherds, and a fair number of uh, metal detector readings. So it, it was a, a good, uh, uh, gave us a good idea of, of where we should uh, place our excavation units. Using the information from the uh, pre-disturbance survey that, that you just saw, um, and the information from uh, the 1991 discovery of St. John's Expeditions, we decided to uh, uh, open up uh, an area that uh, started at what they had found previously. We figured we couldn't do too much uh, uh, damage with our equipment in an area that had already been excavated. And, and uh, we laid out uh, uh, an area that uh, was five meters by five meters. We laid down permanent datum points, laid out a, a series of lines across the bottom to uh, uh, guide us uh, in our grid system, 
and uh, began digging. Uh, you see really the, the first moments of the excavation uh, right here in this photograph. Our chief tool in the excavation of the St. John's Wreck was the uh, water-fed Venturi dredge. Um, this is a long, flexible hose uh, with a, a PVC head, and uh, we have a, a hose feeding into that PVC head with water pumped from on board the workboat. Uh, that water that's pumped down is then jetted through uh, the length of the green hose that you see there and that there's an opening down by where the divers working that um, there's a suction created at that opening by the, the water rushing by and what we have is essentially a four inch diameter underwater vacuum cleaner um, it, this worked really really well for this shipwreck it, it uh, uh, was slow going enough that uh, nothing got by us Here you can see the white water hoses coming off of the workboat uh, to pump the water down to the dredges. You also see a yellow hose floating on the surface. Um, we were diving using a hookah system. Um, we had uh, uh, an air compressor on board the workboat and air was pumped down to the divers uh, via these 100 foot long yellow hoses. Um, we had a, a, a way of uh, splitting the air from this compressor into to five channels so we could run five divers at a time. Working in uh, 15 feet of water, uh, it wasn't unusual for a, a person to spend eight or nine hours a day uh, working on the on the sea floor. Uh, really uh, some some optimal working conditions here. Now the, uh, the goal using the dredges was to dig down uh, through the sand to the top of the shipwreck and, and that was uh, delineated by the stone ballast. We, we excavated down to the surface of the stone ballast that was on the shipwreck site. You can also see there were some objects poking through those stones. There's some cannons you can see pretty clearly. Um, but that was when we knew to uh, stop and um, move on to another part of the grid. Um, and, and really this is how the site was first uncovered. Once the uh, desired area of ballast was uncovered, uh, that was uh, uh, usually a, a five meter by five meter area. Um, once that was uh, uncovered then it was subdivided into uh, using a one square meter grid. Here you can see that, that process in action. Um, basically putting markers every one meter um, in a grid pattern. So over the course of the uh, six summers that uh, were spent excavating the St. John's shipwreck site, you can see the, uh, the areas of the grid that were fully excavated. Um, they're they're color-coded by a year, and then uh, can't quite make it out on this image, I'm sure, but uh, each unit uh, was labeled individually. Uh, each, each one square meter subunit. So uh, this gives you a good sense of uh, uh, how it worked, you know, how we would only see a portion of the shipwreck at any given time. Um, we never saw the, the whole thing opened up at once. Uh, we're only able to tie it all together, um, all our data over the years, using this, this grid pattern. Now the basic tools for the excavation of a one square meter uh, grid unit uh, are, are right here. Um, we have the portable uh, grid itself, um, we have the dredge, we have a basket for removing uh, uh, coral rubble that, that won't go into the dredge, and also for removing stone ballast. We have uh, uh, our baseline, we have uh, some a bag of tags and some plastic bags to put artifacts in, and, and uh, um, all we need are two divers, one to do the digging and one to do all of the recording.